Well, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, coming and sitting with us for uh, this presentation. Uh, really glad the Q&A ERG group was able to pull this together. And, uh, oh, for those of you that are, are watching this at your desk or at your convenience, uh, glad, you, glad you clicked on the link here. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Rajan Moon, uh, Dr. Rajan Moon, I should say. He holds a BA in psychology from the College of St. Scholastica uh, in Duluth and a master's in uh, uh, gerontology from St. Cloud State University and his PhD in social work from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he also holds a nursing home administrator's license uh, and at two area agencies on aging and Minnesota State Unit on aging. He provided project and grants management services as well as managed the largest non-government source of aging services funding in the state at Greater Twin Cities United Way. Currently, Rashan teaches in two graduate programs, right? Uh, provides consultation on aging and disability services, serves as the Executive Director of Training to Serve, uh, which is a nationally recognized LGBT aging and nonprofit. Uh, he coordinates the Finish Strong Private Philanthropy and Public Funders Collaborative. He co-convenes the Gerontological, uh, Gerontological Society of America, America Rainbow Research Group, and he publishes research in aging and disability services. Rajan has served as a Ronald E. McNair Scholar, a Hartford Foundation Doctoral Fellow, an Atlantic Philanthropies Health and Aging Policy and American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow. So, well, very accomplished uh, speaker today that we have for you. Uh, Dr. Moon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. For Thanks being so much here. for having me. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming on this beautiful day. We'll just imagine it's raining. Um, mm -hmm. We're here. It's maybe snowing outside. And um, so um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as was noted, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Training to Serve. We actually specialize in LGBT aging. Um, but today I'm going to do basically the first part of our training, which is an LGBT 101. Um, we'll take some time to chat a little bit about it um, and, and learn a little bit about the history of the LGBT community. Certainly an important milestone this week, the kickoff of Pride, um, Pride uh, Week. Um, training to serve, just a little bit about our background. Um, there was a 2012 study of LGBT older adults and baby boomers that asked them a lot of questions on their health um, and wellness. And one of the questions asked, do you feel you'd be treated um, safely or respectfully if your LGBT status were known? Kind of fair question to ask. Unfortunately, only about one in five LGBT older adults or boomers could actually answer that they would be treated safely or respectfully um, based on their experiences in the past. That's pretty significant, and it's one of the major reasons that training to serve is around today. Um, the fact that LGBT older adults often isolate themselves because of fear. Of, of what may happen to them from a provider. Um, in reality, the numbers show that while there is some issues that happen, uh, abuse, neglect, or harassment, it, it tends to be a very minority, um, a small number. So it really is a belief, and, and this fear or this barrier um, needs to slowly be chiseled away. And that's what we do at Training to Serve. We tend to operate in the health and human services side, and once being a member of state government, I know that um, all branches of state government are uh, immensely important, including uh, transportation, but often we're just down the road at human services or health, training primarily nurses, social workers who are providing direct care services to LGBT older adults themselves. Um, so there's a brochure here on training to serve. Um, I will show you our website very briefly because we're going to actually hear the voice of an LGBT older adult. Um, my card is also up here and I brought some uh, rainbow flag stickers um, for pride. Um, so any questions kind of before I get started? I'd like to start out, you never know um, if there are. Good. Gets a little bit more in depth so um, good to not have too many questions. So. We often start our trainings 
with the voices of LGBT older adults themselves. And while I'm going to focus primarily on LGBT across the aging spectrum during this training, I thought it would still be appropriate to hear the voice uh, of an, an older individual, uh, mostly because it's obviously my passion. And um, our website is uh, www.trainingtoserve.org. And again, we are a, a not-for-profit organization based here in Minnesota. Over the last five years, we've actually trained 5,000 professionals in nonprofits and state agencies across Minnesota and, and even across the U.S. We've gone to wonderful places like Florida and North Carolina and Colorado and other places like Ohio and um, Pennsylvania. So I'll just start very briefly with the clip. This is, again, just going to have an LGBT older individual talk about her experiences and um, her thoughts on aging. I, I just, I think when you are not, not healthy, not feeling good, needing the treatment, um, it's a very vulnerable position to be in. And so I think it is really, really important that people feel acknowledged. For me, as a lesbian, um, I, you know, I wouldn't want to have to hide or pretend. Can you turn that, it up? A it bit? just would add to that vulnerability. I think. And who would want to be feeling worse? A lot of time you know, doing some kind of terminal situation because you can't say who you are. You know. I mean, it's not like a, I don't feel like I'm always broadcasting my sexual identity. Um, but I'm also, I think, in the areas of my life where it really matters to my family, my friends, my workplace, I'm very out. And, you know, all those people know my partner and my daughter and they know my story. And I think if I was 20 plus years older, I, you know, I don't know that I would feel that free. Uh, to talk like that. What if people are, you know, really appalled at me or something like that? Um, I think that is a real barrier. I think it can prevent people from, from, you know, asking for the help they need. Just the, you know, having that, the dignity of your whole personhood be able to be present in your healthcare setting. video just gives our website and then it thanks the organizations that um, provided some funding for um, the videos. There are actually five of them that are available. This, as you could see, was Kathleen, an older lesbian woman. There is an older trans man um, and an older gay man who each share their story. And then there are two service providers that talk about the importance of LGBT um, cultural competency. Um, so. I'll also leave a DVD video here, which I believe is going to be added to your library, um, so you can also watch them there. I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint. And for people who walked in, I'm just going to send around some of these books. Let's send those back. All right. So. <clears throat> This is not the agenda that we're going to go through today. This is the agenda that we go through in our four-hour training. Um, surprise, you're going to be here for four hours, um, especially those of you who are watching on the computer. Um, no, we're only here for about another 45 minutes. So we're actually going to talk about the LGBT 101. Um, so what exactly are these letters? Who are the people behind the letters? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the historical timeline. Um, what have LGBT people experienced? How far have we come in LGBT civil rights? Um, and how much further do we have to go? But other topics in our training, again, this is an LGBT aging training typically, so we talk about unique needs and barriers um, that LGBT older adults face. We have a video case study, which I would highly recommend if you haven't seen the film, If These Walls Could Talk To. Has anyone seen that film before? It's a pretty amazing film. We do a 15-minute clip from that that shows two older women, older lesbian women, and one of them has a medical issue and has to go to the hospital. And how those, that, that lesbian couple are treated in comparison to a heterosexual couple who also are at the hospital for a medical emergency. 
we have specific scenarios. Again, working in the social service um, and human services field, they love to invent imaginary people and then try to save them, right? Um, and so scenarios are very important for social workers and nurses. So we have several of them. Um, we do an assessment. You have that assessment in the um, packet that, that you were given, and I'll go through that towards the end. It's not an assessment specifically on aging, but on LGBT um, uh, competency and welcoming environment. And then you can do some action planning based on that assessment. All right. So LGBT 101, what exactly are all of these letters? I did a training at a care center, a, a nursing home here in Minnesota. And they had to sign in and they had to write the topic of the training. And one woman said, you know, I'm really not sure what we're here about, but something related to BLTs. And um, I said, well, you know, um, not exactly. Um, she was in for quite a shock. It was a mandatory training. Um, I said, there's a G in there, too. What would that G be? And she said, I'm not sure. Some people like guacamole. Um, so um, it's not a sandwich. Um, we're actually talking about several distinct communities. Um, and I'll talk about each of them. Um, so one of the important aspects of LGBT cultural competency training is to try and not have a conversation that's us versus them. That there are these LGBT people and then there are other people that are not LGBT. We actually talk about how um, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression are all important um, parts of who we are. Um, and we use that four framework or four domain paradigm to describe LGBT. And I should say that there are many of these um, different frameworks. This is the one we choose to use um, and has been pretty widely accepted. The domains of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and biological sex. We all have these within us, but we often don't think about them in this context, or maybe don't even talk about them. And I'll give you two examples. If you're in a relationship, perhaps have been um, married for many years, you may have children, that's an important part of your identity. In fact, often if you go out to parties, uh, company picnics or whatever, um, you may introduce yourself as somebody's spouse before you even give your name. That's actually an individual sexual orientation. Right? Or another example, when you woke up this morning, you went to your closet and you selected clothes to wear, you selected clothes on how you want to express yourself. Um, that's your gender expression or your gender identity. Um, so I'm going to talk about sexual orientations and gender expressions or gender identities that may be different um, from ones that you're aware of. So each of these different domains actually falls on a continuum. Um, we like to think sort of in these nice boxes. We like to check boxes, and there's a reason for that. Our minds are actually built um, that way to help us interact with our environment. So for example, if I were to say, we're all going to get on a bus and I'm going to take you down to the high school down the street. Instantly in your mind, you start to bring up what a high school means to you, hopefully not overly traumatic. But you know that there are going to be young people there. It's probably going to be loud. You know, there's all kinds of learning that's hopefully going on. That's how our mind works. The important thing is for us to understand that there are a lot of exceptions to those rules that our mind makes up, right? So if I were to say that we're going to get on a bus and I'm going to take you down the road to a charter school that teaches completely in Spanish, your mind starts to sort of think a little bit differently outside that box of what you would think a school looks like. So that's the same with things like biological sex. Biological sex is defined as our objectively measurable organs, hormones, and chromosomes. It's sometimes the easiest of the four domains to think about um, until you really dive in deep. And as I said, there are a number of different continuum. And so up on the screen, you'll see this um, arrow from side to side going from female to male. And you can fall somewhere on that continuum. You can sort of select yourself. And in social services, we like to diagnose people. So we'll often do that in this class. So think of yourself. Diagnose yourself on the continuum as male or female. Um, sometimes individuals don't fall perfectly into those two categories. They don't check those boxes. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, 
I am a gerontologist, as the introduction um, sort of clearly stated. My whole world has operated in the field of aging. Um, in fact, kind of a little side story, I'm finishing my yoga instructor certification and we have to do a volunteer project. And so I lined up for my cohort to do some wonderful chair yoga with seniors. And unfortunately that fell through and now we're doing yoga with kindergartners. Um, and I met the kindergartners last night and I didn't sleep. Um, so um, I certainly am a person that operates in the aging and, and disability world. And I tell you that um, not because um, I, I'm sort of getting that off my chest, it's very therapeutic for me, um, but it's important for me to explain how babies are born, and I do know how that happens, even though I'm not an expert in children. And I imagine many of you also know how babies are born from probably that seventh or eighth grade health film. Does anyone remember seeing that film? Um, often it was on one of those reels and there was a separate sound and hopefully the reels and the sound kind of matched up, otherwise it was a really funky watching. Um, it was probably maybe traumatic for some people. Um, probably the best birth control is that video. Um, um, so I, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to break it down for you. Um, so generally what happens um, is, you know, mom uh, is at home and, you know, watching TV and turns to her partner and says, you know, we've got that big picnic on Saturday. I think a lot of people would like to meet, meet our little bundle of joy. Let's go have the baby. And so the partner says, okay, I have nothing else to do this afternoon. Let's go. Um, so they get in the car and they go to the hospital and they walk in and there's a triage nurse at the hospital and the triage nurse says nicely, you know, how can I help you? Why, why have you come in today? And mom says, well, I'm, I'm ready to have the baby. You know, it's been about, about nine, you know, nine months, give or take a few days. Um, it's, it's, it, it's time. So the nurse says, wonderful, the doctor's available, head right on back. So. She goes into the maternity ward, and I heard these things are posh. There's even water beds and everything, swimming pools, all kinds of stuff. Mom gets into the bed, and, and the doctor comes into the maternity ward, and um, you know the doctor says, I'm here. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. So mom kind of turns her head, does a little cough, <coughs> baby shoots up. Now I heard they are slippery little devils, and you know, doctor may accidentally drop it on the ground, just blow it off, there's a five second rule, be just fine, you know. Then what generally happens is the doctor takes a little visual inspection, you know, kind of if you've ever seen the Lion King holds up the baby and everyone bows down to the baby, and what's the first thing everyone asks when you say, oh, I'm having a baby or I had a baby? Is it a boy or a girl? So doctor takes a look and says, well, congratulations, you've got a bouncing baby boy. Right? So doctor goes into the next room, and this mom's ready to have the baby too. She doesn't like carrying it around. It's kind of a lot. Her back's hurting a little bit. So um, doctor says, whenever you're ready, mom turns her head, kind of coughs, baby shoots out. This time she's all swaddled up perfectly, smiles, happy. It's a beautiful, wonderful, clean experience, I've heard never participated other than my own, so I'm not sure, but this is what I learned on the internet. Um, so kind of doctor peeks under the swaddling and kind of is a little bit shocked and says, well, you seem to be missing something here. Doctor dons on, ah, that was semester two. This is a baby girl. Um, so, you know, congratulations, you've got a beautiful baby girl, right? That's generally how it happens, kind of. It doesn't always happen that way, and we don't talk about when it doesn't happen that way, right? Sometimes um, babies just want to come out, and they sometimes come out really early and they're not done developing. And um, I do know, again, not an expert on child rearing, childbirth, but I do know once they come out, you can't shove them back in to cook a little bit longer, <laughs> right? It's just not possible. Um, so we may have to breathe for that little baby. We may have to be that baby's heart, right? Um, that baby's sex organs also may not have fully developed. Um, so when the doctor looks at the baby, the, the doctor may not be able to say, congratulations, baby boy or baby girl. Sometimes a baby is born, and that baby is born with both characteristics, sex characteristics of a baby boy and a baby girl. Um, in the past, these children were known as hermaphrodites. Has anyone heard that term before? Yeah. yeah, so hermaphrodite is a term that actually we don't use too much any longer. Um, hermaphrodite actually comes from 
um, more of the animal world, um, which I know humans are a part of, but, um, uh, and it refers to animals that can biologically change their sex in order to procreate. And so I'll give you an example, and you probably have heard this in that eighth grade um, science class, that if we were to take um, 20 male frogs and put them in a swimming pool, um, some of the male frogs can actually change their biological sex to female so that then they can procreate. That is the definition of a hermaphrodite. Um, humans cannot do that. We cannot change our biological sex in order to procreate. So the term that's used um, more commonly is intersex, and that's the term that's in the middle of this continuum. So again, from male to female, and intersex in the middle. Um, anyone heard that term before? Intersex? It's becoming more used more and more widely. So in the past, what often happened with babies that were born and identified as being intersex is the doctor selected a sex for that child. And would anyone like to take a guess which sex they selected? Male, male. Male, male. Well, good job. You, I, <laughs> happy you are right and happy you are wrong. Um, so many people, when I give this training, often say male um, because they sort of want the air, kind of that traditional pass on the name. The actual answer is female, and it's a very simple, logical reason. If you're going to take someone's body and pick a gender, it's much easier to take parts away than to go and back and try and find some spare parts to add, right? So very often, intersex children were assigned the biological sex female at birth. It wasn't their choice. Um, and often, these children were also given hormones to jumpstart their development. Um, and uh, it, it unfortunately can lead to some grave consequences. It can be very traumatizing for an individual who starts to develop and realizes that I'm not female. Um, and it's happened a number of times. There's a famous case in Canada um, where this happened. And he tried to transition back, got married, had a child, um, but unfortunately ended up taking his life because it was extremely traumatizing for him. Today, rather than selecting, the standards of practice is to allow that child to develop um, on the child's own. There is a rush for us to write something on that birth certificate or to paint the walls of a room pink or blue, um, but in all fairness, it's not the doctor's or even the parent's right to choose the biological sex for that baby um, because it's that baby that's going to have to live out that baby's life. So the standard of practice is to allow that child to develop. In some countries in, in, in the world, they've actually established a third gender that can be selected. And there are some countries, particularly countries that mirror our own in Scandinavia, that actually have eliminated gender on a birth certificate altogether. That gender is actually a social construct. It really doesn't matter. Um, so there's lots of different views of, of this concept of biological sex and how it intersects with gender. Um, any questions about that so far? Yes? I'm just wondering about the, uh, the occurrence of this. How often um, do you have some statistics? Sure. Yep, it's actually quite rare. It's under 1% of births um, end up being intersex. Very rare. There are other combinations in um, the psychological world. They're often considered syndromes or disorders. Um, so uh, when I work with medical people, um, I talk about chromosomes, that um, females generally have an XX chromosome and males have XYs. Anyone remember that from way back when? Um, I imagine you don't get that very often at MnDOT when you're reading reports or anything like that, <laughs> chromosomes. Um, you're more about paint and asphalt kind of stuff, I think. Um, so, um, However, there are other combinations of chromosomes that, again, we don't talk about. There's XXY, there's a small X and a, a Y. Um, and again, we refer to them often as syndromes, like Turner syndrome or Kleinfelter syndrome. So even if we took a baby's blood and looked under the microscope at their genetic makeup, we don't always get XX and XY. So biological sex, while we like to think 
check the box male or check the box female, there's actually again this continuum. Any other questions before I move on to our next domain? Yes? Just quick, as far as um, assigning though, I know you said it's out of practice, but aren't there other ways that they could look at an infant to determine like, like the presence of like a, a uterus or something? I guess I don't know when all of this stuff develops yep. at all, but that there would be other things that would indicate what biological sex or maybe was kind of towards on the spectrum more so in you know, those situations. Right. Is that a practice at all? They uh, obviously parents like to know, so they do those type of investigations. But a person who identifies as intersex or who's been born as intersex literally has sex characteristics of both. So you will find organs of both a baby boy and a baby girl. Oh. Any other questions? All right. The next one is actually quite um, simple and is often the one we want to talk about the most, but. Um, we evidently just glass over it because it's become kind of part of society and that's sexual orientation. This is who you are physically, spiritually, and emotionally attracted to based on their sex and gender in relation to their own. Um, I also will note that in the packet that I handed out, all of these terms that I'm describing are in the second half, um, so it, it's all listed there. So again, we're going to have a continuum with arrows pointing in opposite directions. Um, one side is homosexual and the other side is heterosexual. Some people don't like the word homosexual and it is kind of going away um, in our society. Instead, the terms that are often used are a gay man who's a man who's attracted to other men or a lesbian, a woman who's attracted to other women. And for heterosexual, the term is um, often um, used as straight. In the middle of the continuum, you see bisexual. Um, bisexual is often considered the silent letter of the LGBT community, um, which is kind of odd because uh, they've done numerous research studies on the number of LGB people there are. And um, when people identify as LGB, 52% of the population of, of those people identify as being bisexual. And then the other sort of 50, 48% is divided almost equally among gay men and lesbians. So actually bisexuals are the largest um, sub-community of the LGBT, LGBT community. The issue is, if a bisexual woman marries a man, she magically becomes heterosexual. <laughs> and if a bisexual woman has, marries a woman, she all of a sudden becomes a lesbian. But that's not what sexual orientation is about. It's not about your current state. It's about attraction. And a person who has the capacity to be attracted to both men and women, regardless of who their current partner is, is someone that is identified as a bisexual. Does that make sense? All right. That's all with this slide. Does anyone have any questions? When we started doing these trainings five years ago, there was a little bit more um, questions, but generally. Thanks to Rosie and Ellen and Elton John, and this is all. <coughs> all right. So the next one is gender identity. It's how you, in your head, think about yourself. It is part of the chemistry um, that composes you, but also how you interpret what that means. So gender identity. And again, we have a continuum with arrows pointing in opposite directions. On one end of the continuum is man, and at the other end is woman. Um, in the middle, there may be a new term, um, gender queer. Has anyone heard that term before? You may have heard the term queer, you may have heard the term gender, uh, but together, gender queer. Individuals that identify as gender queer, again, don't feel comfortable selecting man or woman of their, of their gender identity. They could be individuals who are intersex, though intersex people may select one of these identities because it doesn't have a lot to do with our biology, a, a little bit, but it's really how we interpret um, our, our sense of self, who we are. Um, we do talk a little bit about this term queer in our training. Um, for you, I would talk about it a little bit differently, but again, using my aging hat, queer traditionally has been an extremely derogatory term used to describe the LGBT community. And for many older adults, it's extremely traumatizing when they hear that word. That was a word that they were taunted 
um, with when they were children. So it's a word that we tend to not use um, from a training to serve, to serve perspective. However, the LGBT community is um, very consciously trying to remove the negative power in that word, the, the sort of oppression and negativity. And so they've adopted it as a way um, to describe the community. Some people may say that they identify as being queer or part of the queer community. Um, and I think that that's definitely a good thing, that people are taking pride in who they are. We all should take pride in who we are. But again, from an aging perspective, I'm very careful to use the word. Um, the advice that we give service providers is to use the language or mirror the language that you hear a person using to describe themselves. So if a person says that I identify as being queer, then you would identify them as being queer. Um, individuals who are genderqueer may choose to not use the traditional pronouns of him and her or he and she. They may use pronouns that um, the queer community has identified. Instead of him or her, they may use here, H-I-R. Or instead of he or she, they may use Z, Z-E. Um, in addition, they may use um, plural pronouns, so they and them, uh, rather than uh, he or him. Or they may actually just use their name, continuously use their name. And if you go to a uh, meeting that's called often by an LGBT organization in the community, when people go around and introduce themselves, you'll often be asked your name, where you're from, and what pronouns you prefer to use, um, which is not something that happens often at other meetings, um, but it can be surprising for some people. Any questions about gender identity? Okay. Our last one is gender expression. And this is how you demonstrate your gender based on traditional gender roles through the ways you act, dress, behave, and interact. And our final continuum with the opposite arrows are masculine to feminine. And in the middle is generally androgynous. I think those are sort of words that most of society knows. And again, you can find yourself anywhere on this continuum. The interesting thing about gender expression is that this is the one that's greatly influenced by society. Um, gender expression differs based on the time and the place of where you are. So I'll give an example. In the United States, it was illegal for people to wear clothing of the opposite sex. So any um, women wearing pants could actually be arrested up until the 60s. In other places of the world, what we would consider um, clothing for women, or, or what we would call feminine clothing, is perfectly acceptable for a man. If anyone's been to Scotland, been there a couple times, there's lots of men walking around in cute little plaid skirts. Um, now, they probably wouldn't call them plaid skirts, and I'm very sorry that that now has been recorded. Um, <laughs> they call them kilts. Um, in the Middle East, it's very common for men to wear what we would consider a full-length dress, right? So place, it, it, it differs as well. So time and, and place, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I try not to kind of diagnose people in the audience. I tend to diagnose myself. So I consider myself to be more on the masculine side. Um, probably not all the way over. I don't have a head for baseball caps, so I never wear baseball caps. I really don't look good in skirts, um, so I don't wear skirts, so I tend to be down on, on that uh, masculine end. So these are the four domains, and what's important is that they are all very distinct. Um, and you can choose a whole combination. And it's important to understand that because the LGBT community is made up of very divergent domains. And so I went through all of these without explaining the T in LGBT. The T refers to transgender, and it generally refers to the last two domains, gender identity or gender expression, right? An individual that identifies as transgender is someone whose gender identity differs from the gender that they were assigned at birth. There are two major categories of people that identify as transgender. The first is someone that identifies as a trans woman. This is someone who was born male and transitions to female. And trans man, someone who was born female and transitions to male. 
We have a lot of discussion about this when we're talking to direct care providers um, because transgender actually has very little to do with your biological body. It's how you identify yourself internally and how you express yourself externally through the clothing that you wear, through makeup, through hairstyles, those, those types of cues. So we'll often say to a nurse who may be providing services to someone in a nursing home that you're offering services to someone who identifies as Joseph but does not have the body that you think Joseph should have. And it's important to acknowledge the gender identity of the person rather than the legal sex. It's who they identify as. So people who are transgender, um, the questions that we often get is, well, what about sex reassignment surgery? Has anyone heard about sex reassignment surgery? Mm -hmm. So this is an actual medical procedure that an individual can go through to change their physical body to bring it more in line with how they feel as their internal sense of self. It's extremely rare, sex reassignment surgery. It's done only in very few places in the United States, and it's expensive. For older adults, it is covered by Medicare, and private insurance does often cover sex reassignment surgery. Um, but again, it's very rare. More often, people will take hormones to bring their body more in line with their internal sense of self. Hormones don't change your um, anatomy so much as change your physical appearance. Um, so you begin to take on characteristics of the gender that you've selected. Um, and in addition, some people may not change their body at all, but may just identify as the other um, gender. So if a person is not transgender, what do we call them? And people will often say, well, that, aren't they straight? But I go back to the fact that there are four different domains and this one is gender identity and gender expression, and it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. And, sec and straight is a word we use to describe someone's sexual orientation, not their gender identity or gender expression. So the term that's actually used most often is cisgender. So again, I try not to use examples in the audience, I'll use myself. I consider myself to be cisgender. So when I came out of the out of my mom, I was a little yellow and had to take some sun lamp time, but they said, oh, you've got a beautiful bouncing baby boy here, right? And I live my life as a man. That is an example of someone who is cisgender. Cis comes from the Latin um, on the same side as. So someone invented this term cisgender to mean that you live life on the same side as the gender that you were assigned at birth. So instead of calling people not transgender, we use cisgender. There really aren't any other good words. Some people say um, they're part of the binary gender or the normative genders, which are just, they're kind of research terms or um, lay people tend to not use them, though, frankly, lay people don't use cisgender either. Um, but that's kind of the term that's been accepted. Any questions about this so far? So yes. the transgender person is one who actually goes to the, gets the sexual reassignment? No, um, a transgender is um, what we would call an umbrella term, and I'll give you another example of an umbrella term, Asian American. Asian American is an umbrella term. There are lots of different types of people that identify as Asian American, whether they're Hmong American, Lao American, Japanese American, Chinese American, Korean American. They're all similar in that their ancestors maybe came from a common geographic area. But a Japanese American is very different from a Hmong American who's very different from a Korean American. It's the same thing with transgender. So under the umbrella of transgender, you have people that may identify as cross-dresser, people who may identify as transsexual. A transsexual is someone who has undergone sex reassignment surgery. You may have people under transgender that identify as being a trans woman or a trans man, such as what I um, have up here. Um, so transgender is a term that describes a whole diverse community of people that live life um, selecting the gender that they were not assigned at birth. Does that make sense? It gets, in, in, in the trainings when I do this, often this is where people's minds stop. And if I look hard enough, I can look in your eyes and actually see the gears stopping. And then eventually they kick back in. Because gender is sort of, you know, this, this kind of protected construct that we don't have to talk about um, and think about what, what else may be out there. 
Yeah. Um, how does like the, these different um, these different modes of, of being transgender? Um, how does one <coughs> navigate the law? Like someone. I mean, on one does do you always have to be called a trans woman, or are you now a woman? Mm -hmm. um, but but like things like. You hear about people getting kicked out of bathrooms because mm -hmm. right, someone says you're not really a woman, and, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. and so how how does right. person navigate that? Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult um, uh, question, but I'll try and provide some insight. If an individual has gender or sex reassignment surgery, they legally can change their um, sex on their driver's license. Um, if an individual has not had sex reassignment surgery. In most places, you cannot change your driver's license. Um, so that's one aspect of that. As for restroom use, that's a very kind of difficult conversation. Many um, new buildings and organizations have what are known as family restrooms, which some individuals may feel comfortable using. In general, the LGBT community advocates that transgender people should be allowed to use the restroom of their gender identity. Um, and you can often see why. Imagine a person who's wearing high heels and a dress and earrings and lipstick walking into the men's restroom um, just because biologically under those clothes um, uh, that person has the anatomy of people that use that restroom. Um, so it's a difficult conversation. There are actually no laws or, or rules related to it. Um, they're starting to. A lot of that is occurring in um, sort of youth yeah, I'm sure you've all heard youth sports, sort of, and, and what teams can, can people play on and, and those kinds of things. So I hope that answered it a little bit. Um, as for the term trans woman versus um, using the, the word woman, that is um, really based on sex reassignment surgery. Um, some people who go through sex reassignment surgery and they've sort of cast off their previous identity will use the term woman for example, um, and actually will no longer consider themselves to be transgender. They have transitioned, um, and, they, and that's what transgender to them is a process, not an individual. Does that make sense? <coughs> so we often get the question of how many are there out there. The problem is um, LGBT people are not counted. They're not counted in the census form. Um, no one is asked to check a box. Um, instead, we have to do research to determine. And what best we can um, decipher is that there are 2.8 million lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, 60 plus in the US. It equates anywhere between 5 to 10% of the population. Um, and there's around 48,000 lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, 60 plus in Minnesota. Um, again, about 5 to 10% of the population. You'll notice that the T is missing from here, and that's because a T is very difficult to define as well. So the case that I just gave of a person going through sex reassignment surgery and no longer considering themselves transgender, should they be counted as transgender? Um, because the, they fall under the definition of transgender. In general, transgender also is about 1% um, of the population. There's about 700,000 people of all ages that identify as being transgender in the U.S. today. Um, so. um, it's even difficult to count LGBT people, and I'll give you an example. Back in the 1950s, there was a researcher named Kinsey. Um, some of you may have heard of Kinsey. He developed what's known as the Kinsey Scale, which is a continuum basically saying you're not straight, you're not gay, you fall somewhere on this spectrum. Um, his research found that about 4% of, it's a college age male population, identified as being gay or bisexual. Um, but he also asked about their sexual habits. And um, he asked, have you ever had a same-sex intimate relationship? And for me, who defines that as being gay or bisexual, I would think that that number would be around the same amount, around 4%. Um, it, shockingly, he found that 37% of the people that responded to the survey had had a same-sex intimate relationship. Um, so even the definition of what it means to be gay or bisexual is kind of tough, because if 
7% have had a same-sex intimate relationship, but they don't identify as being a uh, sexual orientation that has same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. So um, these are just really estimates. Um, How reliable do you think that number is? You. So it's very difficult. The Williams Institute, um, which was the latest study that came out in California, tends to be more towards the 5%. I do think that, that times are changing, um, that um, there are fewer LGBT, older adults that identify as LGBT, but I would caution people to think that there are fewer LGBT older adults. It's just because of a history of oppression that they are so far hidden their sexual orientation or gender identity or gender expression that they will never present that that's their um, younger generations it's changing um, especially for the trans community as well gender transition actually tends to happen later in life um, it happens after sort of a person has retired uh, family have left the home, so there's no children left. You no longer have those um, sort of work requirements, and you feel more free to be the individual um, who you identify as. Um, some individuals uh, who are transgender continue living both lives if they're older, so they have their transgender identity, but then their cisgender identity to maintain those relationships. Um, Individuals who are transgender often try to live the life that we thought that they should live. So, for example, if you look at um, subpopulations of armed forces service, trans women have the highest rate of armed forces service than any sub-community. Um, so, these are people who were born men, but they live life as women. They try to be the ideal model of what it meant to be a, a man. Um, and so they joined um, one of the armed forces, they had children, they had the good careers, they were the breadwinners. But again, as children have left the home and they've left employment, um, they, they will transition, many of them. Other questions? So I wanted to take, we have um, 10 minutes left, and I wanted to take you through a couple of the things at the back of our packet, because they may be helpful to you. So halfway through the packet, you'll see that there's a new cover page, and it says resources and worksheets. And again, I said on the first page of this um, are all of the terms I just went through in the order I, I went through. Um, so they're all defined here for you. The next page is an exercise that we do in our training that I'm not going to do today, but I'd like to walk you through the timeline, which is um, on the following page, and it's kind of a nice little purple timeline. And I think you'll be surprised at some of the things that have occurred over history. Um, there were routine raids and arrests and discrimination in the LGBT community up through the 1970s. Um, you know, a lot of that kind of mass raids and arrests ended sort of um, in the 70s, but as an LGBT person ages, they may have heard things like, in the 1930s there was um, successful electric, um, electroconvulsive shock therapy for the treatment of homosexuality. Um, they would have heard that the US military bans gays and lesbians in the 1940s, um, but the Kinsey study also came out in the 1940s. The American Psychiatric Association in their first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in 1952 listed homosexuality as a psychological disorder. Um, however, at the same time, they may have heard of Christine Jorgensen. I don't know if anyone knows that name, but that is the first uh, individual from the US that had sex reassignment surgery in Europe. And I believe Christine Jorgensen was on Time Magazine of that year. It was a huge deal, huge, huge deal. Um, in the 1950s, gay men and lesbians were banned from federal em employment. In 1967, The Advocate, which is still an LGBT um, periodical magazine, um, it sold out its first edition. And then 1969, the roots of pride occurred, and it's known as the Stonewall Rebellion, which was a traditionally gay um, club in New York um, that was raided by the police and um, it sort of it are, are really the roots of the LGBT civil rights movement um, today. 
Um, the end of the ban on federal employment of gay men and lesbians occurred in 1975. It ended the ban, um, but you still could fire an individual for being um, gay or lesbian in federal employment. Um, in 1982, Wisconsin became the first state to pass a gay rights law. Um, the actual first um, <coughs> Uh, extension of domestic partner benefits occurred at the universities of Ohio, Iowa, and Chicago in 1992. Um, in 1992, also, the World Health Organization removed homosexuality from its list of medical disorders. In that same decade, in the 1993, um, we had Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, which is military personnel shouldn't be asked their sexual orientation. For many people, it's surprising to hear that the American Medical Association didn't remove sexual orientation and related disorders from its list of diseases until 1994. Um, and then in the late 90s, we had the Defense of Marriage Act. And then everything sort of started changing, um, really in the 2000s and, and the 2010s. Vermont was the first state to recognize civil unions in 2002. Um, sodomy laws were struck down as unconstitutional in 2003. 2011 had the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In 2012, Minnesota, which is the only state to have defeated a marriage amendment. And in 2013, Minnesota legalized same-sex marriage. And now, any day, we're waiting to hear um, from the Supreme Court to see if they'll be striking down the um, marriage laws in other states. The last few pages of the book um, are the supportive environment assessment. And again, this is not just aging related, but you could go through and fill this out and see how sort of supportive um, MnDOT is in your materials that you publish. What type of images do you use? And if you look at our images on our brochure, which we have, we also have an LGBT aging resource guide, which I brought a couple copies of. It's downloadable on our website. I'll leave these copies. <coughs> but we use images of all kinds of different people. In fact, this image of two women has a third woman in it, and we just cropped her out. Or using images of single people. Um, so the idea of how do you market, how do you present yourself in the community, using also other diverse images of uh, individuals of color. Um, and other backgrounds. So you can go through that assessment, and then we walk through a plan of action with people that we train. So what are the simple things you could do, such as using the rainbow flag, wearing a rainbow flag, or putting it in your office or your cube or whatever you live in for eight hours of your day every day. Um, there are other symbols. Many of you um, may recognize the um, symbol of a blue background with a yellow equal sign. I have it in my backpack, but um, I'll pull it out. Um, many people don't really know what that symbol is unless you are an ally or part of the LGBT community. It's actually the logo of the Human Rights Campaign, um, which is a national LGBT advocacy organization. Some people also will use the pink triangle with a green circle around it. The pink, um, pink triangle actually has historical significance. Um, during Nazi Germany, individuals that were being persecuted had to wear a symbol on their clothing. We're most familiar with the gold star of David that Jews had to wear, but gay men had to wear a pink triangle on their um, clothing. Um, so the community has taken that symbol back to sort of um, uh, represent a safe environment or a safe place. Um, and then the last um, couple of pages in the guide are how to be an ally to LGBT people. What are things that you can do? And then obviously we work in health and human services, so we have lots of people assessing people. So how do you take a sensitive history? Instead of asking things like, are you married? You ask questions like, who's important in your life? And actually when you ask that question, you'll be surprised at the number of people who are married that don't say their spouse. Um, they may say someone like an adult child who may be a doctor or a nurse or, God forbid, a lawyer. You never want to have a client with a lawyer child. Um, those kinds of things. Um, so just different ways to think about how you ask questions are important. Um, so that's sort of the training that I had for you today. I am very honored that Minnie got 
um, had this, and, and you have an employee resource group dedicated to the LGBT community. I think other state agencies could certainly learn from um, your diversity. Yes? I just want to say thanks. My dad is 85 and he lives in a assisted living in Duluth. And two years ago when I moved him into that place, and he's very out in Duluth in the community, very like a leader in the community. He's organized pride stuff. He's headed up the Gay Men's Center. And he went back in the closet as soon as he went into the same Men's wow. I think now he's a little more open with people, but he was just so afraid. He was so afraid. And yeah. He, you know, it's mostly women, and some yeah. of the women were kind of interested in it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I bought him a poster from the um, the gay marriage celebration, and I'm yeah. like, so hung it in, you know, like behind the closet door, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Uh, Really important work. Really it important is that work. fear. Yeah. So yeah. often yeah. people, yeah. a lesbian couple, go into senior housing and they become sisters. Um, it, it, or friends. This is my friend. Um, so thank you again for coming. And I'll stay after if you have any questions that you want to ask. I'm afraid I missed your introduction. And so I want to know where you're from. Sure. Yeah, and several people missed it, so I'll just very briefly again review that I'm from an organization called Training to Serve, and we specialize in training service providers on the unique needs of LGBT older adults. So you're an independent nonprofit? We are an independent nonprofit. And unfortunately, there actually aren't many LGBTQ trainings out there, so the first, I went through just the first part of our training. Uh, the rest of it is all about aging. Um, so thank you again.